Good afternoon and good morning to everyone on the call today and welcome to today's webcast. Today we're talking about DevOps in banking. My name is Helen Beale. I work for Range 4. I'm a DevOpsologist. Um, I made up my job title myself. It basically means that I study DevOps uh, all day, every day, um, whether I'm doing something like this or working with one of our clients, doing some training, coaching or consulting playing games, all sorts of different things that we do. We're going to talk about that at the end of the webcast today. Um, and we're lucky enough to work with a number of banks. So we thought it's worthwhile just having a look through this particular lens. DevOps, of course, is a set of, um, if you like, horizontal practices that can be applied to any industry. We're going to take a look today at um, how uh, organisations that are in the banking industry um, can use DevOps practices in particular. Um, we're going to look at the disruption um, facing this particular market and I'm going to just draw out a couple of challenges that seem to be very common across all of the banks um, and maybe think about some of the things that we can do there and then we're going to do a few case studies, got four case studies to share with you today um, and then we'll finish off with some ideas about how we can help you on your DevOps journey. So let's talk about digital disruption to begin with. Um, so there's a very good report out there on the internet um, you will get slides um, after this event, or you can find them on SlideShare if you're watching a recording of it. Um, if you're on the call live now, you'll also find them in the handout section on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so this is from uh, CIO from IDG. Uh, and what we're saying here is that there is um, this threat from fintechs. We're going to look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. We've got these regulatory challenges. We've got consumers making all sorts of demands on us. Um, and ultimately, the banks must be able to plug and play into the digital business ecosystem um, to basically ensure their continued success. So minds are having to be changed, um, behaviours are having to be changed, and the way that we choose and use technology is changing as well. So we're kind of going from this, this branch um, capability um, much more online. So Many, many more people are doing banking online now than ever before. Um, much fewer footfall into the branches. And this causes lots of consternation often in the media when um, we announce that lots of branches are being closed. And of course, there are a portion of people out there that will still want to use their branches. They tend to be in the older generation where that's been the way that they do things. Um, they're not so conversant with the internet. They may not have smartphones. Um, of course, there are particular geographies, um, notably Africa, um, where you're much more likely to have a phone than a laptop. So mobile banking um, is very, very big in Africa uh, in particular as well. So um, what Gartner's saying here in IDC is saying that um, all of this, you know, we're keeping on moving to mobile. We all are. Um, I check my bank balance quite frequently, make payments, do all sorts of things now um, through my phone. I'm actually much more likely to use my phone um, than my browser or my laptop. I think that's probably common to a lot of people these days as well. So what are we going to do with all these branches? You know, we've got this uh, clicks and mortar thing that we had with retail um, quite a while ago. Um, you know, people don't value the branches as much as they used to. So we've got to, as banks, um, get, uh, get it together to provide a really rich um, and reliable digital experience for our customers. Um, if we're particularly, if we're talking about a uh, kind of standard retail bank, of course, investment banks um, have similar challenges, particularly when they have uh, individual client type customers rather than institutions. So um, this is a, a survey from the digital banking report. What they've asked here is um, they asked a number of banking IT executives to list their three main priorities for this year that we're currently in, 2017. And these were the top three answers here. So uh, redesign or enhance the digital experience. So as we just said, um, all these consumers wanting to, to access their money and do things with it um, using their smartphones and such like. Um, enhanced data analytics capabilities to identify customer needs. This is really about feedback loop. So those of you familiar with the three ways, if you've read the Phoenix Project, you'll know that the second way is all about amplifying feedback loops. So um, people are recognizing that um, we have all of this very powerful data that we're just not harnessing um, to give us the answers that will help us serve our customers better and deliver better, higher value outcomes to our customers. And the third one, which is quite interesting, um, is find ways to reduce operating costs. Um, when businesses are under pressure, they're always going to want to try and do this. If profits and revenues are falling, then we need to try and take costs out of the business. 
Um, it is unfortunate, though, because we have, of course, been through um, a rather significant global recession and a lot of banks actually have um, you know, lost a lot of staff um, over recent years anyway, um, coping with the, the, the impact of the credit crunch. Um, so this is a tricky one. Um, so we, we, for a long time, we talked about doing more with less, and this is what this is really about. And this is where one of the areas where DevOps really tries to help. Although in DevOps, we often try and um, talk less about removing costs because costs often means people. And actually, we talk about injecting additional capacity into systems, allowing us to do more and deliver more value. I'm going to take a closer look at DevOps benefits later on um, in this talk today. Um, just take a little note on the other one. So um, the fourth one is more um, more warming, if you like. So increasing investment in innovations. That's great. That's something we love to do in DevOps, is focus on innovation. Um, we know about this. We just looked at this, you know, this regulatory and compliance specifications there. It is a very highly regulated industry in banking. We also do quite a lot of work with um, insurance companies and pharma, which are also highly regulated. Um, update or replace components for legacy operating system. So we're going to look at this um, in particular challenges in a moment or two. Um, then we've got talent recruitment, got changing core business processes. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, security and authentication, um, also very key. We're going to talk a little bit later about um, the value stream and shrinking the value stream and the process from ideation to realisation, shifting things left and injecting things like security and quality in early into the process. Um, but interesting, notably last here, we have um, invest in or and partner with an alternative fintech provider. So this, of course, is a big disruptor in the space. We're going to have a closer look at fintechs in just a moment. But just to, to note on this particular slide, that's quite low down there. So a um, comment from the report itself, I just wanted to bring this one out. So whenever installing new digital banking technology in the interest of reducing costs or more operational efficiency, it doesn't help much unless the routine processes that are being automated are first closely examined and streamlined, applying some of the principles of industrialization and efficiency management to processes and operations. So if the financial institution or the bank does it without a proper review and improving of underlying processes, any digital banking initiative will fall short of full optimization and at worst, simply automate already dysfunctional processes. So this is something we've been saying for a long time in the software um, market and in particular, even more with DevOps. So you'll all have heard, hopefully, the mantra, people process tools. Sometimes uh, we now talk about organizations, interactions, automation, giving it a slight kind of a DevOps makeover, if you like. Um, but the point that we're making here is that you can't just directly automate the processes you've got all the time. You need to take a step back and look at those processes first. So people process tools, get the right people in the right roles to begin with, um, then look at the processes, use tools like from Lean, and we've got things like value stream mapping and process mapping that help us understand this and optimize it. And then we can apply automation, which will give us the full capability and full optimization of those processes themselves. Um, so this is actually a slide that I did um, or I used previously in a very similar webcast that we did called uh, DevOps in Insurance. And what um, I was pointing out is that a lot of these retailers were jumping um, on the insurance bandwagon, if you like, and trying to steal traditional insurers' lunch. Um, didn't bother updating this slide because, as you can see, they're all referring to the banks. So banking has the same problem um, in that there are all sorts of threats coming from places that you might not initially expect them to come from. So I said we we're going to have a, a quick chat about fintech. Um, so, again, uh, links to this in the slides. This is a New York Times report. Um, Fintech's gone from a boring niche in Silicon Valley to one of the fastest growing sectors in the tech industry. Um, so sometimes you kind of think, I was thinking earlier, it's like, who are all of these fintech companies? Everyone banders around this term. And of course, some of them are better known than others. So of course, Mint getting very big out there at the moment. Been around for quite a while, uh, well over 10 years. Um, further down this charter, I just have a screenshot here of my browser. If you scroll further down, um, you'll discover um, that uh, people like PayPal are also on there. PayPal's obviously been around a very long time um, and is very large. But you can see um, the internet has given the opportunity for people to build customer bases very quickly and offer new things. So the challenge for uh, banks is to keep up with all of this disruption. 
So let's take a closer look at um, some of the things that we've learned. So I'm just going to pick out two today. So the first thing I wanted to really pick up on is legacy. And we just saw um, in the, the survey report earlier on that this is a, a really big thing for banks. So some of the banks we work with are literally hundreds of years old. Some are a bit younger. Um, and of course, the technology in an organisation, the, the information technology in particular, is not going to be hundreds of years old, but it is likely to be tens of years old. Um, and people are still, you know, have very critical systems. Um, we have a, an insurer that has a very a large amount of money that goes um, through a, a mainframe um, and it has an application on it written in a very old uh, language that hardly any people know. Um, and those people that have built it um, probably won't want to be in the organisation that much longer because they're nearing retirement. So we have sort of people issues there. There's also um, integration issues uh, with older code and also these legacy systems are often very have been architected in a very monolithic manner. So we have a technology issue in that if we want to do things like DevOps, so if we want to automate small pieces and do small tests on small bits of code, um, if we have a very large monolithic application, that's very tough to do. So then we have to entertain questions such as, do we replace the application? Do we re-architect the application? Then we have to do sort of cost and balance checks on saying, if we try and re-architect the application, how much time and effort will that take? And will it be worth it? Um, will there be enough value in that activity? So some really big challenges there. They're obviously not faced by the fintechs that are just building their stuff from new, probably using microservices and containers and such like, um, so that they are able to automate and make changes very quickly. So you know, issues there around people and technology, but there's additional issues around the sort of people factor. So there's technical debt that we've talked about. So technical debt in that description I just gave you was really around the architecture and the ability to pull an application apart to make small, quick changes, which is what we want to do when we do things in an agile and incremental manner. Um, but we also have these culture problems. So I particularly... Um, love this slide. I use it a lot in presentations. Um, I don't particularly like the unicorn concept in DevOps, I have to say, I, on the public for saying that, but I do like this um, thing because it kind of shows us, a, 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 one of the reasons I don't like the unicorn thing is because if you're not a unicorn, what are you? And um, you're a horse, and I just think that's a bit funny. But in this one, we're a rhino, which is much cooler. So, you know, these organisations are and very large, and they're really trying to keep up with these unicorns. So um, in this scenario, I guess we're saying that fintechs are unicorns. Um, but it's tough because there's a lot of people in these organisations um, and they uh, are humans and they have behaviours and they have learned to do things in certain ways and they follow certain processes. And um, sometimes as humans, we build systems that aren't as functional um, or as healthy as they could be. So we have to deal with things like cultures where people are maybe... Um, driven by fear, where there's a lot of blame, people, they, people aren't very transparent. We have a perhaps we have a lot of top-down sort of command and control behaviours, which means that people um, aren't very good or aren't allowed to be very autonomous. If we're trying to do things like um, have self-organising teams and have people um, accountable and responsible and wanting to do more things, um, it's hard for us to to move the needle. The other big bit of cultural debt that we see a lot, particularly in the larger banks, is around uh, outsourcing. So um, outsourcing on the face of it seems like a great idea and lots of CIOs were hired to save their organisations lots of money and outsourcing made a lot of sense and, and people I'm sure uh, a lot of bonuses. Um, and what we've seen is kind of cycles of this um, where stuff has been outsourced and then another cycle has been made and the outsourced provider has been um, even more drilled into the ground and what sort of began as a partnership becomes um, very much kind of a supplier um, relationship where uh, perhaps the service levels are, are compromised um, because the contracts have been ripped down to their bare bones. So it's a really big challenge. Um, and of course, a lot of the outsourcing companies are not necessarily in the, comp in the country where a lot of the original staff may reside. So obviously, India, a very popular place for outsourcing, Eastern Europe as well. So it brings with it like, a number of geographical and time zone challenges as well. So if we're trying to be really good at collaborating um, and we have different cultures in different places and we don't see each other very often, it can make it hard to do. So the other big challenge I really wanted to bring up is about regulations. Um, and again, 
um, I mentioned earlier, you know, this isn't exclusive to banking. Um, insurance companies are also very highly regulated as a pharmaceutical companies. So lots of people are facing these problems. And the, the really big one um, that I'm going to bring up today is around um, segregation of duties. So people kind of go, right, segregation is really important. The auditors want us to do it. We've reorganised ourselves so that we're in separate places. But now we've got DevOps and we want to blur the lines and bring these people back together and does this mean that our developers are going to have admin access to production systems because we can't have that because of segregation of duties? So it doesn't mean that you can't do DevOps. Um, it means that we need to think carefully about how we do it and understand the processes. So back to that very first statement that we had, we really need to understand uh, these processes before we try and automate them. And automation really is a key um, so part of the solution to this particular problem. So for example, if we have something like a uh, release and deployment automation tool, we can do things like have very granular access on who is allowed to do what and see which things. So we can start automating workflows and we can start having roles and responsibilities very clearly defined and in a way that the auditors will approve of. So let's have a, a quick look at how um, the leaders are doing some of this stuff um, and what uh, what kind of solutions they're coming up with. So just before we jump into that, I wanted to share with you, probably familiar with this, the crossing the chasm. So really this kind of thought about where, where banking is on this um, kind of adoption curve um, in relation to other industries. And I think the important thing to, to state probably is that, and I kind of already inferred this, a lot of banking organisations that have been around for a very long time are huge and they have lots and lots of humans in them and lots of moving parts. Um, and that means that we'll have lots of variations through a single organisation in terms of maturity, whether we're talking about cultural maturity or technical maturity. So most banks will have had some kind of digital initiative um, to create the, the websites where people can interact with their money and their mobile phone apps. And the digital initiatives will often be um, leading in terms of DevOps maturity, so sort of down at, at the, here. Um, but other parts of the bank may be a bit slower. So um, you might find, for example, we just talked about legacy. We might find that the mainframe users are feeling that they're being a bit left behind and aren't really able to do this DevOps thing. Um, but what we have found is that uh, legacy systems absolutely can be automated and we can do cultural things that allow us to be much more agile in the way that we work with these large uh, mainframe systems. So you sort of kind of think about where you are on that. A useful thing to do in assessments, and we're going to talk about assessments a bit later, is to try and plot where the various parts of an organisation are in terms of maturity um, in order to use the best practices across the whole organisation. So the first case study I wanted to share with you today is this one from Capital One. So the case studies I've chosen today are all very public. So you've got uh, all of the links in the slides again. Um, so Topo here um, talks at quite a lot of events and he talks quite regularly at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in San Francisco. Um, so he's talking here quite a lot about tools, um, but these benefits are, are pretty important. So he's getting hundreds of code commits per day and that, you know, is from probably a bunch of applications, not one application, but this is interesting to think about what frequency you've got at the moment and what frequency would be useful. And what's underpinning all of this is the idea of value outcomes for your customers. So the more improvements you can make, the happier your customers are and the more thriving your business. Um, again, integrations from once a month to every 15 minutes. If you're integrating large amounts of changes infrequently, the chance of things going wrong is a lot higher. Um, we talk about CI a lot in, in some of the training courses that we do, in particular the DevOps Foundation course, and one of the points we like to make is that although we naturally think of CI and CD as something we do when we're agile, um, in fact, you can do CI when you're doing waterfall. It makes a lot of sense. So um, CI is basically integrating, developers integrating their code to trunk or master um, at least once a day. Um, and every time they do it, it gets tested that it works. So it's quite easy to imagine if you've got hundreds of developers developing code for a month and then they all try and integrate once, how many things could go wrong. So it, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And this is about, um, as I said earlier, this is about building quality in. So this is part of the shifting left and getting these tests done early. So in traditional waterfall, 
environments we would run a large test phase after development usually that test phase would get quite squished um, because development would typically overrun because projects typically overrun um, and quite often quality prop quality is uh, massively compromised as a result um, so you can see here as well the comment around QA and the deployment went from manual to completely automated this is a, a really good point as well um, around um, the automation and the auditability and the um, the relationship that people have with outsourcers. So just want to give a couple of examples. One of the banks we work with has been using a deployment automation tool for quite some time. Um, and a couple of years ago, they were asked by their auditors what a certain web page looked like on a certain day. And because they had a deployment automation tool, they were able to go to that particular date and deploy the website as it had looked on that exact day for the auditors. So very, very powerful for these regulations um, that people need to follow. And the other example I wanted to give you is actually not a banking example. It's um, a UK government example, a company we worked with. Um, again, it's a deployment automation example. And the challenge that they had is they had a, a particular system that was very complex, had lots of moving parts, and it um, needed to have web server application servers built fairly regularly for it, so uh, WAS servers. And the outsource company was um, engaged to do this piece of work, and they had a 140-page manual that they would follow to install and configure a web application server. Um, and often what happens with outsourcing arrangements is you don't get the same people day to day. So um, someone might learn to, to do something one day and then the next week it's someone else that's got to do it. So you get a lot of inconsistency there. And in, with these very manual, lengthy tasks, there's obviously a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, so what this particular uh, government organisation decided to do, um, and this is a tricky conversation to have with your outsource partners, um, but they just went ahead and did it. They basically set up a WAS deployment tool that automated that whole process. So it meant that they could just press a single button and that WAS server would be deployed in the correct configuration. So a massive amount of time saving, a massive amount of risk taken out of the process and a really good platform um, for the auditors. Um, part of the reason that you might struggle having some of these automation conversations with your third parties is about the contract. So um, quite often the contracts are kind of people-based um, and they can see the benefits of doing automation, but it doesn't really follow logically that they would want to do that um, because it um, doesn't match the contractual work that they've agreed to do. Um, so just to summarise Topo's story here, driven by data, technology and data science. So um, that really brings us back to kind of what we were looking at earlier. You remember that poll um, and the second answer um, second most popular answer from the IT executives about what they were looking at technology-wise in 2017. Um, and this is, again, about data. So using data as that brilliant feedback loop to help us make better decisions. This story is from, uh, from the Netherlands, um, and I particularly like this quote. I liked it so much I gave it a heart. But IT has become the beating heart of the bank. So I have a lot of conversations with people at the moment about um, whether it's DevOps anymore or whether it's biz IT, because what I keep on observing is organisations where the IT people have pretty much kind of got the principles sorted in their heads and they're starting to do agile. Um, but things are happening like they can't quite get the product ownership um, that they need from the business. And they are having to do things like have uh, business analysts and business architects acting as proxy product owners in the agile process, which doesn't work very well. Um, so we have this problem of engaging uh, business and IT. So we've been through a few rounds of this already. You know, we had um, IT aligning with the business, IT integrating with this business, but where we're trying to really get to now is IT is the business. So um, some of our other customers, notably uh, Hiscox in the insurance industry, Robert Hiscox, who founded Hiscox, stood up a few years back now and said, we're no longer an insurance company, we are a technology company. And this is where we really need organisations to get to, realising that in this very digitised world that we live in, um, technology is of strategic importance and absolutely critical importance to things that we do. So kind of this is the, on some of the cultural change. You know, people, humans have worked in these organisations often for a very long time. They're very used to the way that they see things. Um, but quite often they need to change. And when an organisation recognises that, that technology is this important, that technology drives um, what they're doing and is absolutely key to them having a profitable and enjoyable future, 
this is where um, we start having decent conversations between business and IT. And lots of people are asking me at the moment, like, what does the DevOps um, target operating model look like? You know, what happens to IT? Um, and John Fletcher from Hiscox did a very good talk at DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, just last week where, we, where he was talking about this and the fact that IT should no longer exist as a separate department in the future. Um, people will be so conversant in IT and IT will be so embedded in everything that we do um, that it just won't exist as a separate um, organization. Um, so Ron uh, it, it was quite dramatic in what he did. So uh, we had a DevOps Foundation course quite a while ago now. We had um, an IT director, Mike from Paddy Power there, and we were talking about culture and changing cultures. And he came up with this phrase, um, if you can't change the people, change the people. And the whole room was kind of appalled by this. He kind of said, no, no, you can take them on a journey. You know, it can be sort of a year long. You tell them where you're going. And at the end of the year, if they haven't really got on board with it, then it is probably time for them to move on. Um, you know, people are obviously very precious about their jobs. That's the way we, we, you know, we finance our own lives. So it can be quite a scary thought sometimes for people to change. And not everyone has the same ability to change. Um, what Ron did was something quite dramatic to get to a new organisation model and a new way of thinking is he actually made everybody reapply for their jobs. So very dramatic thing to do. And, you know, ING isn't the biggest bank in the world. So, you know, it's not possible, I think, for a lot of organisations to be that dramatic about their approach. But it was it, it had the desired effect for him. So, um, again, benefits transformed from a risk averse um, organization to agile powerhouse and lots of banks are risk averse um, because you know they're very highly regulated and things can happen that are very painful and very expensive when we get things wrong um, he got his time to market down so um, time to market we often prefer to talk about time to value now when we get into a sort of metrics conversation lots more automation loads less handovers so we're going to look at value streams later but you know this is a handovers are a massive source of waste and delay um, and very much this collaborative culture. So he managed to get his new culture established where things happened rapidly and frequently and reliably. So the third case study I wanted to share with you today is French Bank. Um, again, this is Carlos. Um, and then he really talks about ROI so, and, and metrics as we just started to touch on. So you know, he wants these two sets of indicators. First, transformation itself, and the second, about the business value. So we'll keep on coming back to business value. It's not always natural for us in IT to talk about business value. We're not um, often very conversant to do, um, in doing it, um, but we need to learn to do it if we're going to have that relationship that we want to have with our business people. If we want to have close relationships with our product owners that help us prioritise things, um, we might want to think about working with them to write value into our user stories and our product, cap uh, product backlog, for example. Um, and then on the other side of the world, uh, a New Zealand bank, Westpac, uh, sorry, Australian bank, Westpac. Um, I love this. It started with a question, what would a great day at work feel like? So, you know, really, really cultural. So getting into the softer stuff um, and the harder stuff comes later. But if we you know, go back to what is our organisation? Why? What makes a good day at work? What what are the pains that we're feeling? So huge um, reduction in deployment cycles. A uh, massive drop in customer outage time. Here, again, the value. So they, they know about the value. They're measuring the value and they can tell you how much is being delivered. So um, this kind of began as a bit of a silly thing, the Beale Headmark Golden Square. But basically, um, it started on a LinkedIn conversation. And we were talking about the Iron Triangle, where there's this belief in IT that you can't have uh, low-cost stuff um, that is high quality at high speed. There's always this idea that one of these things um, on the cost, uh, quality and time triangle has to move. But with DevOps, we're really saying you can have it all. You can have things that are low cost and fast and very high quality. And we have kind of have this fourth dollop here. So customer delight. So we want customer delight because it keeps them coming back. Um, so just talking about kind of legacy uh, again for just a moment and and change, um, I just popped this slide in here. This is actually from last year's DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, John Smart from Barclays was also speaking at this year's, but last year he stood up and he made a statement about the amount of projects he'd managed to move from Waterfall to Agile. And I asked him about um, specifically continuous funding because it's a big challenge um, when we move in IT to do things in increments and two weekly sprint cycles um, but we're still getting annual budget cycles. So we're still getting a massive chunk of money that it takes us months to get signed off. 
um, and then we're spending it sometimes up to 15 months after we thought about it. So um, John said uh, last year, this is what they'd, they'd done. So they'd started to pilot agile investment with quarterly rolling wave instead of annual budgeting. And I should really write to him and get an update on how he's doing with that. Um, so I just wanted to pop this in. So this is from the DevOps Handbook. Um, hopefully you've got a copy of this or you're thinking of getting the copy. So um, very useful uh, statement. I like to break it down um, and ask people whether they've got a shared version control repository with pre-blessed security libraries and a deployment pipeline that runs code quality and security scanning um, that deploys into known good environments that already have production monitoring tools installed on them. So a lot of people have got a lot of this, but the ones that people really typically fall down on is the security elements, so the pre-bus security libraries and security scanning tools. Um, a lot of people have production monitoring tools as well, but it's interesting to think about what those things are monitoring. Are they just monitoring server performance or are they monitoring value? And that becomes an interesting question for people to think about. So how can we help? Well, um, we're working on this thing at the moment, um, this emerging DevOps super pattern. So we're trying to do some work to explain to people how these different elements um, methodologies, systems of thinking all converge together. So we've talked for quite a while at Range 4 about the harmonious polygamous marriage between these three, so ITSM and Agile and Lean. Um, and we're working with um, John Willis in particular to um, incorporate the theory of constraints and safety culture and learning organisation. And I've also done quite a lot of work on the correlations um, between DevOps and Holacracy as a particular kind of cultural element. So um, we're doing a lot of work to help understand and distill thinking into something that's usable and practical. And what we're really trying to do is, I mentioned this before, is look at this value stream. Um, we have this idea to realisation, so we call it ideation to realisation, or a heart of ka-ching. Um, she's Damon Edwards' version of the phrase. Um, the time it takes for us to think of doing something and then realise the value and report that value back to the business and make decisions based on the data we collected. We're just trying to shrink that DevOps. We're trying to make that faster and faster and faster by taking waste out by using things like Lean. So if you think of it, um, we call it the DevOps loop. Um, so ideation to realisation. This is basically a continuous release cycle. So this kind of differs um, visually from how we used to uh, display an SDLC, which was very linear um, and step by step. So really trying to help people track and measure their features and their issues or tickets, whatever you want to call them, as they go round the loop and then what they're worth here and then getting that feedback back into the cycle. Um, so forgive me for not correcting the slide that has insurers written on it. Um, but what we're really talking about here is these kind of benefit areas. So as I said earlier, slightly concerning that lots of um, banking IT executives are still looking for taking cost out because what we want, really want to do is talk about innovation and we want to talk about capacity and we want to talk about um, flow and removing waste and injecting capacity that way. Um, so, you know, getting leaner, reducing the amount of rework. It's very hard to measure quality, but we can measure unplanned work and rework, and that tells us a lot about things that are broken. And most organisations on a DevOps journey will have um, a kind of lump as they start to uncover all the technical debt that they have. This is very well explained in the latest State of DevOps report that came out just last week. So if you haven't got your hands on that yet, highly recommend that you do. Um, so the things that we can do to help uh, we do a lot of assessments. We have both a physical assessment and virtual assessment. The physical assessment is constrained by the amount of 45-minute interviews that we can perform over a set period of time. Um, the virtual assessment helps us with the very large enterprises because we can basically email a survey and gather a load of supporting data that way from thousands of other people that we otherwise wouldn't interact with in the physical assessment. Um, that allows us to deliver a roadmap of um, using things like the theory of constraints it says right these are the key things that you need to tackle these are the highest value areas for you to work on uh, we have lift off workshops that help people bring a whole team of people into a room and get some consensus over what devops means and learn to do things like uh, use vis visualization and kanban and write value um, uh, value investment cases and um, learn more about soft skills and motivational styles um, we are a devops Institute partner. So we also have uh, lots of courses. We have the very, very popular DevOps Foundation course and then follow on courses. We've got some new ones coming through. So we're just um, adding DevOps Test Engineer right now and imminently Continuous Delivery Architect. So lots of DevOps courses that you can either take as public schedule or we can come and deliver on site. Uh, we also 
wrote, co-wrote with our Dutch partner Gaming Works, um, The Phoenix Project as a Game. So hopefully you're familiar with read the Phoenix Project book. So we have that in a one day game that we um, come and facilitate um, with up to uh, 15 people in your organisation. And it uh, helps you relive the Phoenix Project. So it's a very practical, experiential way of um, learning about and using DevOps techniques. Um, we also do lots of coaching, um, lots of agile coaching in particular. Agile is a, a really tough one to get right. Um, so we help people make improvements there, um, help people build the tool chain that will allow them to do what I described in terms of ideation to realization. Um, and then lots of value stream mapping to help people get rid of that waste. So I've run over um, just by a couple of minutes, so sorry about that, but thank you for your attention. And let's just see if we have any questions today. So let's have a quick look here. So I forgot to mention at the start, but if you do have a question, there is a questions box. So it's open and we're ready for questions at the moment. If you would like to put any in there. So I can't see any coming through today. So um, in that case, I'm going to thank you all very much for your time and attention. Um, that was a very whistle-stop tour. If there was anything you would like to query after the call, uh, you know where we are. Um, do get in touch. Enjoy the rest of your days wherever you are. Thank you very much.